Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the FamVestor podcast. I'm your host, Sunny Burns. And I'm your co-host, Sun Marie Burns. So this week, we have some exciting news. We are getting our house painted mm-hmm. as we speak. Well, sort of. It happened today and tomorrow. Uh, so we're taking this, I don't know, how old is this house? It's old. Uh, 1920s, I think. Probably hasn't been painted in 40 years, I would say. Mm, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, it had this really ugly siding on it. It's very old. It was very dirty and discolored and sun bleached, I guess. And yeah. Just in general, a bad color choice. It's like this tan faded color, which was fine. And then this bread, red brown trim yeah. everywhere, which just really... Yeah. Really dated it. Right. Actually. So we're painting the trim white and then a nice modern, like navy blue exterior color for the siding. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's looking great. And uh, it is costing a decent amount of money, you know, completely outsourced for 4500 bucks. But it's a two duplexes on one lot. Um, and I think it's going to make a world of difference. Yeah. I'm excited to see the uh, improvement that it brings. You know, even just the fresh, clean slate to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it'll be awesome when it's all finished yeah so look at the show notes we'll uh put some pictures there for you and uh enjoy that and today uh we have a good episode for you guys we just talked uh with dan hines who uh we've asked we were kind of just like firing a lot of questions about you know just when couples get together for the first time like how do they kind of start planning like what are the first steps to you know organize their finances share bank accounts budgeting, saving up, you know, paying down debts. What do you do? So we were kind of just talking all about that. And I think this is a great episode for any couple, you know, looking to just start being intentional with their finances. Right, right. So without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to the FamVestor Podcast. If you're looking to raise your family with intention, gain financial independence, and live a life of true freedom, you're in the right place. Join us as we explore together how to create thriving families, because strong families are the cornerstone for a world at peace. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the FamVestor podcast. I'm excited today. We have Dan Hines on the show. He has been a financial coach for six years. Uh, He is, um, you know, he has the blog Adulting with Money. And he's been, you know, coaching millennials for, you know, last six years, just how to get out of debt, buy houses, everything you would want to know in the financial world. So we're going to be asking him a lot of questions. You know, we haven't really had anyone from like, from from the kind of ground level of just starting out with money. And, you know, you get married, no one really tells you what to do. You, you know, you have these bank accounts. So I'm just excited to dive in deep with Dan. Anyway, Dan, welcome to the show. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Sonny. Thanks, Anne Marie. Thank, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to help out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very excited to dive in because, like I said, you know, I don't think we really had. Uh, I kind of feel like it's almost basic, but you know, we talk about a lot of like in-depth topics on this show. We just yeah. had an episode about Roth IRA for kids, um, but you know, a lot of couples always ask us like, "How do I get started?" So I th- <laughs> feel like you'd be like perfect guest to kind of talk about you know the do's and don'ts and um, you know where what- do you start when you know nothing. Right, right, right. Right. All of a sudden, here you are, you've got a job, maybe you're married, you know, maybe you're starting out and there's so many choices you could make at this time in your life. Oh, yeah. Choices that could be great for your future or very problematic for your future. And it can make all the difference, the guidance that you receive during that time. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. I'm a little curious about your own story. You know, you're an engineer, you have an MBA, uh, and now you're a financial coach. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like where, yeah. where did this passion come from with helping others uh, with their money? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Yeah. So I graduated Iowa State with an electrical engineering degree, but then I got my MBA and I fell in love with finance. I fell in love with business and management and I skipped all the marketing and advertising classes I could. I just did all (laughs) finance. Uh, And so and then so right out of college, I had the opportunity to become a financial advisor. So, you know, helping couples and families and individuals with stocks, bonds, mutual funds, Roth IRAs, 401ks, uh, insurance, all that good stuff. Um, but then I got to a point where, you know, it's, uh, you know, we were talking about Tim Ferriss and the four hour work week and then trying to do things on your own. And I come from an entrepreneurial family. And so I thought, you know, if I, if I really want to do my own thing, I've got, I've got to leave the firm. I've got to leave where I am and, and, and start on my own path. But my passion really lied with, you know, helping people with the basics. That's that's really what I love to talk about because, you know, until schools and, and parents start getting really into more personal finance, 
for their kids. It's kind of, I have some job security <laughs> talking about <laughs> I this would basic say so. stuff about, you know, getting out of debt and budgeting and just handling the day to day stuff. Cause I think most people, they get a job and they get a paid check and they pay their bills cause they're due and then, and it's a deadline. And then they're like, okay. It's a hamster wheel what. of life, right? <laughs> get paid. Yeah. Pay your debts. Get paid. Pay your yep, debts. Yep. And it's, you know, as Robert Kiyosaki says, it's a rat race and, and all sorts of stuff. And so, um, you know, so, so I had that passion. So I actually joined our family's business uh, and then but then have this financial coaching business as well, because it really it, it touches that that deep passion in me. It's it's that way to contribute to give back but because i talk to so many couples and i help them i'm also growing as well because then they'll ask me questions that no one's ever asked me before right. so then i got to go research it and then my knowledge grows and i just get better and better <laughs> right awesome yeah. and you know i'm curious how 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 was it when you first got married how long have you been married by the way Let's see. We're coming up next month is our ninth anniversary. Hey, ninth anniversary. Nine years. Yeah. That's Congratulations. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and you being this MBA, you know, working in the financial industry, did you like have the plan? You know, hey, you know, you got married and you're like, this is going to be the plan. This is what we're going to do. How was that for you? <laughs> um, actually, no. It was uh, essentially what happened was, you know, be even before we got engaged, uh, my oldest sister gave us a book, which was like 10 dates you should go on before you get married or something mm -hmm. to that effect right. and of course one of those dates is money like okay read this each of you read this chapter go on a date talk about it and come up with your plans and so we kind of had this like oh, okay well you know maybe we'll have one joint account where all the bills come out of then we'll have our separate accounts all that stuff um and then once you get married all of that just kind of goes out the window <laughs> you just, <laughs> you just kind of hit the reset button and like okay now what do we want to do um and so for us the the funny thing was and, and really kind of my origin story when it comes to personal finance. So like the the big finance with big F finance, you know, that's the, the stocks and the bonds and, right. and options and all that stuff. I have a degree in that essentially. But the 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 minor stuff, hey, it was, you know, I was still kind of in that unknown territory as well. And my wife came home, we were in an apartment and I was sitting on the couch. I could see her come in that front door and she had these giant bags from Target uh, and she was decorating the apartment. And so I'm pretty sure she had pillows. So the bags were extra big <laughs> this time. And the first Shopping thought I spree. had, yeah, the first thought I had was what in the heck did she buy this time? Right. But, you know, we were newlyweds and, you know, I, my, my parents are still together and, you know, it's it come from a big Catholic family. And so in my mind, I'm like, well, if we're going to make it 60 years plus, then I need to never think that again. <laughs> so what do we, what do we need to do to not, for me to not think that? And I, gosh, I hope she doesn't think that of me, my wife. Um, and, and how do we go about that? How do we become a team? How do we start getting things together? And, you know, just started reading books and blogs and all that good stuff. And YouTube, I guess, was a thing about that. It was 2011. So YouTube was still a little young. Um, but, you know, it's kind of the same idea today where, you have a question and you start Googling it and you, you figure it out. <laughs> right, right. I think you touched upon something that is a huge stress point in a lot of um, m relationships, young and old. You know, right. it's I just mean, like. Money is like the number one reason for divorce, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And there's usually mm -hmm. one partner who's more inclined to spend and another who's more inclined to save, you know, and kind of the friction that grows if communication lines aren't open to have that healthy talk about financial parameters and you know what mm -hmm. what we are comfortable with each other spending in our relationship and so forth so that was kind of like an aha moment i guess for you and where you realized yes. we have to be intentional about this if we want to build a strong relationship with one another that isn't going to be wrought with financial arguments right and i'm curious you know let's dig in in that scenario and you know when couples approach you and say yeah you know my husband is always spending money he buys the latest iphone and the iwatch and the, all this like uh, what do you tell these couples like so that they can get on the same page i know you have like an arsenal <laughs> of tools and tactics and i'm sure it's yeah. customized for each couple but generically like what's good advice for that particular scenario what, what do you like to say Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I think the the biggest piece of advice that everyone can take away is that 
Um, you'll never be able to influence someone if you're judging them. Mm. So that's the first thing I want to try to help couples get over is to say if if your if your husband or your spouse or your partner um, buys something and you think that's a stupid purchase <laughs> or that's a silly purchase, that that needs to be the red flag is to say, okay, you know, that's I'm judging that uh, that payment or that mm. you know that that purchase. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you know, especially if a couple needs to in in increase their communication let's say that's where we want to start to talk about that and that's that's the goal that we're getting after but especially when it comes to the financial coaching i also love to tr try to find a common goal like do you both want to buy a house are are you both tired of renting are you both tired of corporate work are you both tired of your debt you know what's just that what's that one thing that we know as a me as a coach and you as a couple and us as a trio that we know that you want mm -hmm. and, and once we have that then the conversation always revolves around that like oh well should we do this well well does it help it help you closer to that goal right. um, you know if, if you're buying that thing that you think is silly or you you know your partner thinks is silly is that ha helping you towards your goal or are you getting towards your goal in the speed that you want? And you can go by that. You know, mm -hmm. it's trying to find that middle ground between responsibility and fun mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, whatever fits their lifestyle and their their personalities. And does the couple need to have like a common goal? It has to be the same exact goal for both of them. Or do you feel like they can each, you know, the husband can have one goal, the wife could have another goal. You know, how does that work? That's that's a good question. Um, It, it definitely helps if they have a common goal. So mm -hmm. quick story. I helped one couple where um, the, the wife w wanted to get a master's degree and the husband had a hobby uh, racing go-karts. He, he, <laughs> he was karting, um, which is which can be very expensive with parts and travel and, and all that stuff. Uh, but then they both both wanted a house. And so they both were tired of renting. They both wanted a house. And of course, all three of those are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, okay. And so the next thing we did after deciding, okay, this is generally what we want. Um, the next thing we do is try to go find prices. Like how much does a master's degree cost? Like, when do you want to start? And if we were to turn that into a monthly number, what is that number? Same with the carding uh, and same with, you know, the house, like how big of a down payment, you know, have you gotten pre-approved or anything? You know, wh what have you done so far? And what happened was that the wife went and talked to her employer and it turns out like they pay for master's degrees. Wow. So they're like, she's like, oh, okay. I didn't know that. Mm. Now that I know it's eventually going to be free, like that's kind of an easy yes. And then they started to look at shop, shop for houses and what down payment they want and all that stuff. Uh, and then the husband looked at the carding and he decided on his own to, to give up that hobby wow. because he wanted a house so much more than that. He was okay with that. And because we started tracking their money, um, I think they were using Mint, but you know, whatever budgeting software you want to use, spreadsheet, paper, I don't care. <laughs> but you know, we, we got an idea of how much it costs them to be them. Right. And then once they looked at the numbers, they're like, oh, wow, like we're going to have to give up a lot if we want this. And right. that's really what I want to get couples to is that they make their own decision. I'm not forcing them to be frugal. I'm not forcing them to give up anything. I want them to see like if they're going to say no to one thing, it's because they're trying to say yes to something else. Mm. Yeah. So to answer your question, <laughs> long story short, is that um, having a common goal really helps. But if they each have a, a big goal and we can make it fit, that's okay too. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I like that. I feel like that, you know, having that sense of purpose, having that, you know, direction that you both want to move to is so valuable and important. And I think that's like one of your first steps you like to get from couples, right? To, to reach yes. out for that. But then also to measure where you're at and to measure, you know, have a real close look at, you know, what's going in the door and what's going out the door. And when you analyze that, you can really truly make the decision, is that worth it or not? And, you know, does that align with the goals that we, we're both uh, collectively pursuing? I think that's awesome. So Absolutely. on so on that train of thought, um, how do you help couples figure out what they're spending on a monthly basis, and how long do you like for them to track their finances before taking other uh, more actionizable steps? Like perhaps you want mm -hmm. them to monitor what they're spending and then make decisions on where they can cut back. Tell us about that process. That's a good question. Um, and so when it comes to my coaching, I really love to be with couples for three to four months because, you know, the financial world is a monthly thing. And so, you know, if you're going to try to ride a bike, you're going to need a couple tries at it. And the same goes with budgeting is that that first budget or that first plan, 
um, is just, it's painful because mm. there's so many decisions to make mm. and you're doing it from scratch. Mm. But the good news is the second time around, you're just tweaking it mm -hmm. and you've all, you're already done it once. And the third time it's like, okay, you tweak it a little bit more uh, and you learn as you go. So when I'm working with couples, we're kind of trying to do everything at the same time. Mm. And so what I like to teach is that all finances to be to master finances is you really need to f master about three habits. And the first is setting goals, which we've talked about. And it's not just setting goals once it's learning how to set goals. So that way every month, like if you reach a goal or, you know, I don't know, a pandemic hits or something, then your goals change. <laughs> that never um, yeah. yeah or, or you get out of debt or you, you know, you reach a goal, then having that habit of looking at your goals and seeing how close you're getting is, is a good habit to have. The second habit is then tracking the money. Uh, so using an app or a spreadsheet, uh, paper, cash budgets, whatever the case may be. And then the third is then um, having that plan. What's You know where you are, you know where you want to go, what's that next step? And if you master those three habits, you'll master money for the rest of your life. So my coaching is not just knowledge, it's like, it's walking people through by the hand, building those habits. And so they email me questions and I answer their questions and their what ifs and, and, and stuff like that. But then to help calm them down, to keep them, because <laughs> habits are hard to build. Yep. And that, that's really what I'm trying to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, especially financial habits. It's hard to break some of them and it's hard to start up new ones. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, what, what software do you like to use or what's the typical, is it spreadsheet form? How do you have your, your clients track their expenses? Sure. It kind of depends on the client and how tech savvy they are or how frustrated they get with technology. Uh, but if they're good with apps, um, I love to suggest Mint, uh, mainly because it's free. And if they try it and they end up hating it, then they can get rid of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if they're willing to spend a little bit of money, I know it, YNAB is fantastic. You need a budget.com. That's some great software. Um, but I definitely steer them away from things like Quicken or QuickBooks, not because it's bad software, but it's just way too complicated mm -hmm. <laughs> for what they need. Like it's, you can graduate to that someday. Uh, but the, what Mint has and what YNAB has or every dollar, um, there's a really good one for couples. Um, oh, Honeydew. That's mm. a really good one for couples because you can each have like your own budgets and your own accounts, but then you kind of share things at the same time. So that's a really nifty app. And, and so it, it, I have to get to know the couple first. And we talk about you know, what's going to fit their personality best, what fits their, you know, where they are. I want to I want to give them a software that's going to give them the best chance for success as opposed to you have to use this one or I'm out. <laughs> And, and uh, along that train of thought, do you have each partner uh, in the relationship track their expenses separately or do you have them combine it together and kind of give it to you as like a, a lump sum? This is what <laughs> we did together this month. Well, uh, definitely with couples, I go for, you know, joint expenses. I mean, if you're a family now, let's look at everything. If you still have money in separate accounts, that's okay. I mean, it, it, maybe you need to take some time to, to get used to joining your accounts. That's kind of my goal. But when it comes to software, you know, if, if that has all the things in one place, it's like you have a joint account. So it, it, it's kind of that nice middle ground where technology solves that problem, or at least is, is a stepping stone towards that result. Nice. So Dan, you know, talking about, you know, having separate budgets and combining them, I'm curious what your take is on, you know, once you get married, you know, a lot of people have this discussion or this argument about whether finances should be combined. Oh, I make way more than you. Why should we combine finances? Like, what is your take on, you know, the best chances of creating a healthy marriage and the relationship with money and how that works between a couple? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the best chances to, to be a couple long term is to think of yourself as a unit as a team, as, as a family. And mm. so the more you can do to combine your money in some way, the better chances you're, you're gonna have. Because if you try to keep it separate and like I make more, you make less, and what can happen with that is there can be guilt. Mm. Um, it can be guilt like, well, oh, you know, I shouldn't go shopping because I don't really, you know, make the money. It, it could be a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad. Um, and it could be where then you start to have power dynamics. And <laughs> that's not very good for a relationship is mm -hmm. that if you, if you see yourselves as 
a team, then it's not about who makes more. It's that are we making enough for us? Mm -hmm. And so especially when it comes to talking to these couples and, and I'm and I'm listening for their language, I'm, I'm listening for those pronouns to say, are they saying me and I or are they saying we and us? Mm. And I tell you what, it makes me feel really good and stops my sweating when I hear the we's and us. <laughs> I'm like, OK, well, that's one problem I don't have to solve. That's good. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think you bring a good point there is if, if you keep it separate, then you continue to think of yourselves as a separate entity and there's more space for uh, accusation or misunderstanding and spending there. If it's, mm -hmm. if it's combined and you really see it, then you become team players with one another. And I think that's huge, yeah. not just in your financial um, snapshot, but in, in just the way you, re you view your relationship um, and, yeah. and your life. Absolutely. And so, and, and I think it's also where I don't try to get couples to do a joint account right away because it really doesn't do anything uh, unless you mentally you're ready to combine things in your mind. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I kind of compare it to just because you bought a gym membership doesn't mean you actually start going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't want to have couples get a joint account to think, oh, that's going to solve anything. Like, well, it might help a little bit. It, it'll help with the logistics because you have fewer accounts to track. Mm -hmm. But if one, one side of the couple or both of them aren't mentally ready to say, yes, this is our money, it, it didn't really do anything. So right. I, I focus highly on communication and then we get to the logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you mentioned there was uh, like a recurring expense, you know, and I'm, I'm always very cautious of signing up for any recurring expenses just because especially, you know, you've been doing this six years. I feel like the services have just increased that people sign up for, you know, you have mm -hmm. Spotify, Netflix, Amazon oh, yeah. Prime, you have any, anything really can be a subscription based service where every month, you know, a certain portion, it may seem small, like Netflix might be $9 a month, but when you stack that with everything else, you know, mm -hmm. $200 a month going out for these services, I just want to wonder what's your thoughts on subscription based services or just like monthly expenses and what you see and uh, anyway, what's your thoughts on that, Dan? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, you know, thinking about our own budget and what we spend, you know, we're probably about 200 bucks a month on various services. We have Netflix, we've got Hulu and we've got Spotify and we've got, and I also go to CrossFit. So mm. that's a month, that's a huge monthly expense yeah. just for, just for working out. But here's the thing is that because we're so, um, intentional with spending our money is that we can't afford those things and all the other stuff. It's mm. kind of like all that stuff we were able to, to afford second. And so that's where, you know, going back to the couples and their goals is to say, I don't want to tell them to just like, well, you've got to get rid of Netflix because you're with a financial coach now and you're on a budget. So you have to be <laughs> frugal now. It's more about like, are you okay giving up that $11 a month and that Netflix in order to get this? Mm. I want you to make a trade and I want you to be comfortable with that trade because the other answer is, well, why not start a business and just make more money? Mm. I mean, if, you know, if, if you're okay with spending that time driving Uber or starting a business, real estate investing, it, it, it comes down to, I want to know what they want and I want them to know what they want. So then we start to make those trades because it could go either way, make more money or, or cut back. Right. right. Okay. So I guess once you're starting to like itemize, once you're starting to, you know, budget and start to look at all those expenses, you kind of walk them, walk the couple through with line item by line item, all the the expenses and see what what is actually providing value to their lives. Yeah, that's and that's a great way to put it. What what is the value to that? Because I mean, I've got this lightsaber up here. Um, <laughs> that's that's two hundred dollars nice. at Disney World. So of course, Disney World it costs a hundred dollars just to walk in the door. Yeah, and that's another two hundred dollars for that, and now. It was another 30 bucks for the stand for it to, to stand on. But, <laughs> but that's all price. When I see that, I see an experience. I see a story. It was a vacation with my wife. Mm. And so the, the value to me is through the roof. Like $200 is nothing compared to the memories that I have when I see that toy <laughs> in the <laughs> corner um and this you know and the same goes for a lot of the books on my shelves is that you know a book might be 10 15 dollars but the the knowledge that you gain that will last you for the rest of your life is a huge amount of value so yeah so that's another conversation is to say well you know are you getting enough value out of netflix or hulu or disney plus compared to what it is that you really want uh so yeah no that's a great great point <laughs> 
And yeah, and I think that that is a very important point. You know, it's not that you shouldn't spend on things, but that what you when you are spending on them, they are intentional decisions that are financially responsible given where you are in your mm -hmm. financial snapshot. You know, like something like that may be seen as valuable in a person's life, but if they don't have the financial responsibility for it, it may not be the wisest choice in that moment. And learning how to discern between whether it's worth taking that plunge or not, you know? Yeah. And I guess that sort of brings up the topic of credit cards and mm -hmm. credit card debt as well as other debt and how to gauge when is it worthwhile um, accumulating debt is it ever worthwhile? And what's your perspective on credit cards? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, I'll, you know, the, so the MBA finance guy in me, um, you know, my the, the high level idea of debt and leverage, I guess I'm okay with. Because I mean, here we have a house and we bought this house with, with a mortgage, but we hate paying interest. So we're trying to pay the mortgage off as fast as possible. So, you know, when it comes to those lower interest things like 3%, 6%, the good thing about loans like that is that if you're investing and making 7, 10, 20% somewhere else, it can help to balance things out. The problem with credit cards, you know, and especially piling up that debt, to me, what that says is that that was unintentional spending. That was, or or it was a severe emergency. Like that mm. was your last choice. You know, med you, you think of things like medical bills or just with the pandemic going on, like how are you going to make ends meet? So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I try to teach my couples not to judge and I as a coach also try not to judge. Your situation is what it is. Um, but then you start to see, once we start to do the math, and a lot of my couples don't do the math. Uh, once I show them like how much this is actually costing them over 20 years, they right. go, oh, okay now we get it <laughs> right because some of these credit card companies right they're charging 20 30 percent interest uh on late payments and you know overdue balances yeah i mean yeah. i'm sure you've seen what's the highest you've seen for interest rates on credit cards oh gosh i mean it's i i hear of 30 percent. i yeah. haven't seen them personally but it's you know it it's it, it makes my skin crawl and not to mention you know payday loans or or something you know going to a pawn shop or something like that it it can get a lot worse than just credit cards as well right now so, now um here's a question about credit card debt specifically and i feel like there's a lot of confusion around this topic i know i heard conflicting information growing up too is whether carrying a balance month to month on your credit card is a worthwhile idea in mm. order to build your credit score. I oh. I heard uh, a few times, you know, like, oh, you should always keep a little bit of a balance on your account. Never pay it off fully at the end of the month. Keep a little balance and carry it mm -hmm. and just make, you know, regular payments of like $80 a month towards your, your debt amount and mm -hmm. it'll build your credit better that way. And then on the flip side, I feel like, you know, the approach we've taken is, you no, know, you pay your balance off completely at the end of each month because you don't want to carry a balance because then interest can start accruing. And that's where the these businesses make their money off of you. Yes, yes. So uh, I would go with the you should pay everything off as fast as possible because you look at. So the funny thing about credit scores is that there's a bunch of credit scores. There's like a mortgage score and FICO 7 and FICO 8, and they're probably up to FICO 10 now. And there's like a car loan score. So there's so many different credit scores out there that it, it's hard to kind of keep track. But at least with FICO itself is that the two largest parts of your credit score are, have you paid on time a lot of times in a row? And how much debt do you have? And so that it's your debt utilization. Because if you have of two credit cards that have a bucket of ten thousand dollars and you've got five thousand dollars on it you're at fifty percent that's bad but if you only have you know a thousand dollars or i can't remember the numbers i said so i don't know the math <laughs> <laughs> but if it's lower that's a good thing and so having zero balance on your credit cards i can tell you i i don't think my wife and i have ever been late and I don't know that we've ever carried a balance. Maybe once, maybe twice, you know, because we moved and something didn't come in the mail right. It, it's possible, but you know, we have near perfect credit scores and we do not carry a balance. And we do not we don't have car loans and we've got our mortgage. And that's it. So it's absolutely possible to have a really high credit score and zero balance 
being paid over. So if you're paying interest, pay that off. Don't right. don't give the banks the money that they don't need. Right. Yeah. We're in the 800s. We've never had a overdue payment. Um, I think it's just a myth. I've researched that in the past. It's just a yeah. myth about carrying a balance being a beneficial thing. It's just a trap. You know, you're setting, oh, yeah, I'm going to put the minimum, the minimum. And then soon enough, your $100 balance turns into 10000 You're like, how'd that happen? Yeah. Um, and then yeah. you're just trapped and you can't pay it. Yeah. And that's that's a dangerous myth to just say, oh, you're good. All you have to do is pay the minimum and you'll be fine. And right. say, well, there's 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 better ways. <laughs> right. They want you to do that so that they can get the interest. Um, so there's a lot of couples who, you know, the unfortunate situation is when they start out, they have varying kinds of debt. They they have school loans. Yeah. They may have an auto loan. They have credit card debt. In what order would you recommend it being most helpful to couples who are going to try to attack their debt? You know, where should they put their focus? Should they yeah. spread it out between them all or should they target one area over another first? Yeah, I think I saw on your website, you said like the average American has like 15,000 in credit card debt and like 50K in like student loan debt, Some, something about mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So I think that comes down to um, doing some sort of like debt snowball or debt avalanche report. And so um, I'll have to share you guys with a link, but there's a, a website called uh, Calc XML uh, and they've got like 50 uh, finance calculators. <laughs> I, I, love there, yeah. I love going to that site. And they're the, so for, for those that don't know what like a debt snowball is, um, is that you, know, you have all these debts and you have all these minimum payments. And a lot of people, when they pay off a debt, they go, yay. And then that, you know, maybe their minimum payment was 50 bucks a month. And now that 50 bucks a month goes towards fun or, you know, whatever else. But the idea is that now you have 50 bucks a month that you can pay the next loan off even faster. Mm -hmm. And when that's paid off, that those two minimums together pay the third loan off even faster. And, you know, that's where that the idea of the debt snowball comes from. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's three ways you can do it is the first way is pay the smallest balance first. And that's the debt snowball. Um, and that psychologically, emotionally is a great way to do it because the faster you pay off one of your debts, it's a quick win. And as humans, we just love quick wins. We do, <laughs> you know, you look into behavioral economics with Daniel Kahneman and Tversky and Dan Ariely and all that stuff is that if you can push that emotional budget button, uh, you're gonna probably be setting yourself up for success. However, there's those of us that love the numbers more and mathematically, uh, what you're going to find is that the debt avalanche or paying the highest interest loan first mathematically is going to be the fastest. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, is if you go to that Calc XML, you'll find a third one is like, well, if I'm paying the minimums, which one's going to be done first, which one's going to be done second, which one's going to be done third, um, just based on paying as fast as I can. And the great thing about this calculator is that you put in all your numbers and you look at option A, B, and C, and you just pick whichever one's faster, hmm. uh, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of time, every time I've run a report for some clients, they almost nearly tie. It almost doesn't matter mm. depending on depending on their mixture. I mean, if they have a lot of credit card debt and almost zero car loan, then definitely highest interest first is probably going to help them the best. Mm -hmm. um, but it might be like a month or two. Mm. <laughs> it really depends on on the math. Mm -hmm. So that's what I what, that's what I aim for. So we talked a little bit in the beginning about you know how you. You know, uh, you had one of these books that told you on one of these dates, talk about money. Is that yeah. kind of what you recommend? I know you're talking mostly to couples, so they're kind of kind of gone through it. But what would you like recommend at that point? Do you think that is a good thing to talk about before you get married? Like what what questions, what questions to ask for and uh, yeah. things to be wary about, honestly. And just yeah. just know what you're, you're signing, signing up, up, for. up for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so. I'll say what I think in general, and then I'll get more specific is um, in general, I think when it comes to, to marriage and dating and stuff like that is to really try to get to know each other's personalities. Like if you haven't read the five love languages, mm. that's a wonderful book. Love that Gretchen. Book. Yeah. Gretchen Rubin's four tendencies is a great book. Hmm. If you can do like a Myers Briggs together or a disc or an Enneagram or, you know, some of those personality things to, to understand each other because it goes back to that judgment is to say that I know. So if it, I love the four tendencies by Gretchen Rubin and I saw her talk in, in Chicago. And so I am a uh, questioner. Like I just, 
I, you know, I question everything. I put a lot of doubt into stuff, but once I make a decision, like I'm all in because mm. I've asked so many questions, like I'm convinced. <laughs> um, and so I, I really try to meet my inner expectations. Whereas my wife is more of an obliger. She's more of a people pleaser and like, she'll bend over backwards for everybody else. And sometimes it, it comes back to bite her and she, she gets really tired as that obliger. Um, and, but so knowing that, then we can start to talk about how we handle money, how our person, how we make decisions with money. Well, I'm a questioner. So if we're going to try to make a decision, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. <laughs> and, um, and so going back and you know, we each have our fun money. She's got her fun money. I've got mine. And because she's an obliger and wants to make sure everything goes well with the budget, she almost never outspends her fun money. Mm. And even though I'm a money nerd, I almost always overspend my fun money. <laughs> I almost always go over budget. And so it, when it comes to getting married and having that relationship is truly to understand each other and your quirks. So that's kind of step a step one, <laughs> uh, but then getting into the questions about money, then start to go back into how did you grow up with money? Mm -hmm. How did your parents handle money? What are your fears about money? How, you know, do you like to spend do you? Do you enjoy convenience? Do you hate making decisions uh, you know, and to like, how do you feel about debt? Have we, do you know what an emergency fund is and what do you think about it? Uh, you know, what do you think about investing? Are you risk averse or are you more concerned or are you risk averse or are you risk taking? Are you, are, are you okay with gambling or does that just give you the willies? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of, a lot of questions like that to, to explore, mm. to get to know each other. And then once you start picking your goals and narrowing it down, things start to make more sense. Cool. Very cool. Um, what, what you said about fun money was interesting because I feel like that was kind of key. And you kind of alluded like in the beginning, you were talking about, you know, seeing your wife spending all this money. It's like, where is this money coming from? But I feel like once you allocate fun money, it's like, OK, yeah, she's, you know, spending within our, yes. our pre-agreed upon budget. You know, you get to spend this. And that's what we did when we first got married. We were like uh, and it was kind of every expense kind of like an overall budget you get to spend 450 a month i get to spend 450 we just go to the atm at the beginning of the month withdraw that money and that's yep. all we did it was very simple just cash 450 450 and it's like yeah you can buy whatever you want i can buy whatever i want and and we're happy as long as we kind of stick to that and i think it, yeah. it takes out that that judgment you know of oh was that a worthwhile purchase and it's like you know differing perspectives to some it is to others it's not but as long as it was planned for and allocated in your budget of fun money, then it really doesn't matter whether, you know, your spouse thinks it, you know, was a silly purchase. If it, mm -hmm. if it was within budget and, and it was a responsible choice, then. Yeah, then absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, the best part is, and then we get to tease each other with it as well. It's like, she'll be like, I want to, you know, I want to buy this and I'll just automatically say not in the budget. Just, just, be, just to be a butt about it, <laughs> just, just to be the husband and to, and to pick on her. But she's like, I got plenty of fun money. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess. We're right. um, and so, but so then you have fun with it. And once you kind of designate those rules for yourself, then you know you can start to play with it. You, you're, you're on the same team. You know the same rules. You're playing the same game. But you're also, you know, you have the same goal of, right. of what winning is. And, and to bring that back to the separate accounts and joint accounts, it could be where if the couple, if it's just easier to have separate accounts and then those are the fun money accounts, problem solved. Mm. You know, that's, and that's where you can set up automatic bank, bank transfers and then you have your own debit cards and you just, you, you roll with it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, you know, I feel like a lot of this stuff, you know, just sounds like boring or technical or you just don't want to do it. But I feel like just setting up the groundwork once and like really coming to an agreement and just taking a hard look. Yes, it might take, you know, you said three to four months you work with your clients, uh, mm -hmm. but I feel like it sets your life up. You know, like, like we mentioned, number one reason for divorce is you know, money. And so mm -hmm. if you can get rid of that financial frustration and it's not like, I mean, you said, you know, you can make more money here and there, but a lot of times I'm sure they're not making more money. They're just finding out, you know, where the money is going and then taking a hard look and then making sure that you have the allocation set up. So you're going to meet your goals and mm -hmm. just have an mm -hmm. agreement to. And I think, yeah, just having that communication um, is, is just so key and so important. And once you get it done, I feel like it's so much, uh, so much smoother your life could be. Well, and one thing I want to say is that my one of my mottos is consistency beats perfection. Mm. And, you know, the, the phrase that you just used right there is that once you have it done, then you're good to go. And what I would say is that 
you're probably never going to be done mm. <laughs> is that it's always a constant evolution is that you do it for a little while and then you find a little bit better way of doing it um perfect example is that you know we were budgeting every month we start we still are budgeting every month but we were trying to budget for like vet bills and dog food and dog meds and then mm. one day we're just like why don't we just put everything under veterinary and call it a day <laughs> And it's like, oh, okay. And we made our lives easier. So, right. you know, and, and so the first way was working fine for years. Mm. And then one day we decided to make that switch. And it's like, all right. And you, and you just kind of find those little things that are annoying. And it's like, oh, well, let's make it easier. Yeah. And you do that. And then, you know, my hope is that we'll probably hopefully start to budget quarterly mm. in the near future where we've been doing this for eight, nine years now. Yeah. And it's gotten to the point where it's almost annoying to do the monthly budgeting. Why not do quarterly? And if, and if once we get out of debt and, you know, once we have enough retirement funds, why not do it yearly? So, mm. you know, I, there's also a balance between how it's okay to be more detailed and more complicated because you don't have wiggle room and you really need to keep a close eye on things. But as you know, your world gets a little bit better and it opens up a little, you can loosen up and uh, because you're just not at as much risk. So there's not one way to budget either. It could be different time periods and different apps and different ways of doing it. Uh, just whatever works best and keeps you happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. What does a healthy budget look like? What would a ratio be of your, you know, this is what you bring home every week. Uh -huh. How uh -huh. should you look at that money in order to know that you're budgeting responsibly? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the best analogy that I have, because I've been on, because I work with couples and I've been on a lot of wedding planning podcasts, I have like wedding budget brain. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think the best analogy is to say to, to, to a bride or a groom is to say like, oh, well, here's a template. You're supposed to spend 25% on a dress and 10% on the venue and this much on food. But in the end, depending on where you live and how much money you have and what your preferences are, those ratios are going to change. Mm. And so my, my philosophy is I try to never give those numbers. Mm. <laughs> I really try to never worry about it um, because even if you say like, oh, we're saving 15% a month for retirement, I'm like, well, depending on when you started and what, what you're investing in and how long retirement is away, you might not make it mm. or you get done early. <laughs> Maybe you could back off and have more fun now if, if you want. And so uh, uh, I guess a perfect budget in my mind is to say that um, did you spend money or invest or save money towards the goals you want and keep the plan on track as you wanted and then you have fun with the rest mm -hmm. that's that's really what i'm going for a budget to me is only has one purpose did you get closer to your goals and did you not dig yourself further into debt everything in between i don't care if you went over budget on groceries i don't care if you went under budget on electricity or you saved on your fun money like if you put money towards your goals and you didn't go deeper into debt i'm a happy coach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dan, you mentioned something earlier about, you know, you having a goal to pay down your mortgage faster. I'm just curious, you know, I imagine you got a 30 year mortgage. How much are you thinking that you're going to be able to shave shave off in terms of time? And then mm -hmm. how much of interest will that save you? Do you know? Um, I don't know a perfect number, but um, we got a 30 year mortgage, but we've been paying it like a 15 nice. since the beginning. So awesome. we will be done in at, at least 14 years and six months at the last I checked. Okay. So it's going to be between 14 and 15. Um, and I know, well, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I'm sure it's probably close to a hundred thousand dollars. We're saving ourselves over the course of our life for, for doing that. Wow. Um, but it also, that strategy is to say, well, if we ever got into trouble, mm -hmm. we could back off from the 15 to the 30 and use that extra money every month for whatever emergency that, that we're going through. So, I love building wiggle room into mm. a budget. So whether it's the mortgage or we also love to just have like 50 bucks a month for auto repair. Mm. We don't use it every month, but by the time we need a new tire or a new set of tires or a new radiator, there, there's a couple hundred dollars sitting there. Mm. Um, and that, that really helps out mm. having those, um, sinking funds, I guess you could call them to just kind of keep an eye on that over time. Mm. Awesome. So Dan, I'm curious, you know, you had mentioned that your family has a family business and I'm curious, you know, looking back 
um, when you were growing up. How was your understanding of finances shaped and formed through the influence of your family being entrepreneurial and having a family business and how that affected your outlook on um, budgeting and spending and mm -hmm. how to handle finances? That's a good question. I mean, growing up, we, you know, I, my first plane ride that I can remember was actually going to Jamaica. We went, I, we went on a family trip and I was in, I think third grade. Um, and you know, growing up, I'm just like, yeah, we went to Jamaica and then we went to Disney world. And then, you know, we went to St. Martin and we had all these family vacations and it's not until you really get into like high school and you talk to your friends and you realize, Oh wow, my life is a lot different than than a lot of my friends. And so, but but the good news from that is that I saw the you know the the spoils of being a business owner. Mm -hmm. the, that that time freedom to take those vacations and mm -hmm. some of the money freedom to to be able to afford them. Mm -hmm. And you know I've got this uh, this red stapler back here on my bookshelf because one of my favorite movies is Office Space. And so you know <laughs> that combined with my dad being an entrepreneur, like I. I did not want to be an office drone. Like I wanted to find a career and an income that I was passionate about that helped me afford those types of vacations and things of that nature. Um, and to my dad and my mom's credit is that um, they taught me uh, even in high school, like how to balance a checkbook. It's like, okay, here's a credit card. We're going to go shop for your school clothes, swipe the card, sign the, the receipt. Um, and then once a bill comes in, like, okay, write a check, here's how you balance it. And so, you know, they made sure I knew that mm. uh, before I was even a sophomore, before I even had a car from what I can remember. Mm. Um, and so they were huge influences. And mm. so, you know, when it comes to the couples that I talk to and the couples that I coach uh, and, and I help them out, that, that's why I want to also ask them about their background to see just where their mindset is and, and how I can help best uh, where they are today and just help them take that next step, wh wherever that may be. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, coming from a family background where your family did run their own business, you know, it, it, you have to have a certain level of financial savviness and responsibility in order to make a business stay afloat, you know? And so I feel like there's a lot of valuable lessons in budgeting there and balancing, mm -hmm. um, what you spend versus what you bring in. And it's something that you can apply throughout your life. And, you know, in a way you can look at your own personal finance as your business, you know, are you yes. handling it, you know, in the most efficient, effective way possible or, you know, or are you not, you know, the stakes are a little <laughs> bit different than, you know, here's the shop. And if I don't do this right, you know, I go under. Um, yeah. But I feel like it's really a great, approach to finance that people who don't have that experience perhaps never get. And I would say, you know, this, the school system and the nine to five corporate job um, lifestyle doesn't really teach you a lot of those lessons. You know, it's more about mm -hmm. oversimplified, here's the money, go do whatever you want with it, you know, and uh, a lot of people aren't graced with that, that experience growing up in a home that teaches them those essentially basic lessons, you know, but mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. life changing and important, you know, on, on yeah. a larger s scale. And yeah. on, on kind of a higher level, I'm, I'm kind of excited about how a lot of schools are going online or, or figuring out how to go online, because hopefully that also opens the door for smaller entrepreneurs that are teaching like entrepreneurship to kids or mm. personal finance to kids. It's like, well, the school, you know, if the parents want it and, and it's there and it's easy, easily accessible, hopefully that something like that picks up. It kind of puts me out of a job as a financial <laughs> coach, but I think I've got a couple of decades where that, you know, I'll, I'll be all right. <laughs> I'm going to get into real estate investing as well. So I'm, I'm, I'll diversify my income as I go. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, but right awesome. now you have a service that is much needed. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, and you know, the good news is I'm happy to help is yeah. that I, I just love talking about this stuff. I love reading about it. It's, um, it's just a joy to do. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm cool with it. <laughs> and, and I love that. You know, that's what we're all about here on the Fanvestor podcast too, is just, you know, sharing with others things that will help make their life better in one way or another. You know, if you if you learn something, if you know something that could profoundly impact someone's life for the better, why not share it, spread that, you know, it's fulfilling for you, it's fulfilling for them, and it's helping everyone kind of live their best life. Absolutely. 
Okay, maybe we'll send it there. That That's it, good. all I had. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. No, I'm, I, it's, it's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's been great talking with you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yes, a thanks for pleasure. having me. Very good. Yeah, and it, I mean, and I'm definitely looking to get onto more podcasts. So if you know of any other podcast hosts that you think my take on personal finance could help their audience, let me know. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to jump on a call. Great. Will do. Will cool. do. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Nice talking to you. All right. Good talking to you. Have yeah. Well, Dan, thank you so much. I feel like you've said so much to our audience, so much to uh, to really get them started, get them thinking. Um, if people have more questions, want to get to know you better, want to see some of your resources or get in touch and get some coaching done, where can people reach you? Yeah, the best place is my website, which is Adulting With Money. Um, and also, you know, I've been talking about the couples that I coach and I have a free giveaway. So there's a free PDF called Couples Crushing Debt and it's your six step formula to faster freedom and unshakable motivation. And this is essentially the six steps I put my couples through uh, and I help them walk through. Now, this particular PDF is about debt, but if you change that from debt to like saving up for a house or saving up for a vacation, saving up for a wedding, um, you know, it can be whatever goal you want to be because a lot of what's in there is the, the communication as well and just trying to build those habits. So if you go to adultingwithmoney.com, it's right there on the, the, the homepage. You can check that out there. Um, but then you can also, if you want to come ask me a question, uh, I'm putting out a weekly video on YouTube. So youtube.com slash adultingwithmoney and, you know, ask me questions because the best videos that I make come from the questions that I get asked because I'm, I'm just trying to give the people what they want. So come, <laughs> come interact, come engage, come ask questions. And I'd love to, love to help out. Awesome, Dan. Thank you so much. And all those links will be in the show notes. Dan, thanks again for coming on the Fan Investor podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome.